enhanced, enhanced sensing, compressive sensing uh, using quantum mechanics. Okay, thank you. Um, I just hope that uh, Yakir doesn't find an annihilation operator for the universe we, so that uh, we can all be here in uh, the present. Um, so, um, also, I feel a little bit of uh, heat from uh, speaking between Yakir and uh, Sandu on uh, weak values. Uh, so, that's something that we actually do. And um, just to let you know, uh, we are working on, uh, sh we basically have recently shown that the better your weak value, the more easy it, uh, you can saturate a, a Cromer Rauban. What is that uh, noise? Uh, is that a hearing aid? Okay. It's the final boundary condition. Okay. Okay. So, um, and also to let you know that um, uh, Halliburton contacted me the other day because they have these tilt sensors that work at about a nano radian per root hertz. And we said that using weak values, we've been able to get to pico radian per root hertz. And they were uh, very excited. So there is actually a tremendous, uh, it seems to be a, a great interest in, in applications beyond just sort of in the lab. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about um, uh, compressive sensing, which I find to be a very fascinating field. Um, these are uh, some of my students that are working on this um, compressive sensing and uh, some of the things were done here in collaboration with Bob Boyd in the Institute of Optics. So um, I'm just going to, here's a brief overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, give a little bit of an introduction into compressive sensing and uh, then talk about some of the applications uh, that we have for compressive sensing, which um, has been really fun to work on. So. First of all, to start off with a little bit of information theory, what is entropy? So if you just think about the Shannon entropy, basically if you have some random variable x, and random variable x has, uh, for example, uh, it can be a coin flip, head or, heads or tails, and then you want to know the probability distribution for heads or tails. And so then you can compute uh, the Shannon entropy. And in, when finding the Shannon entropy, essentially you want to find um, the number of symbols, uh, for example, is alphanumeric. And you want to find the probability of those various symbols. Uh, you want to find inter-symbol correlations, so on and so forth. But compression removes inter-symbol correlations. So that's what allows us to get down to much greater um, amounts of uh, storage uh, because we're using, removing inter-symbol correlations. And it's exactly the opposite thing of what you want to do, for example, in quantum cryptography. So um, we're going to play a little bit of Wheel of Fortune here for a moment. I don't know if, how many of you play Wheel of Fortune or have ever seen Wheel of Fortune, but it was a popular game show when I was growing up. Um, so I'm going to give you an alphanumeric example. Um, I, have a, I have two words here. I want you to tell me the entropy of this symbol right here. Guesses. Okay, that's pretty good. And why do you say four? Okay, good. So there are 26 letters in the alphabet, but they're not equally probabilistic, right? So, okay, very good. So you're getting a good, a good estimate here. Okay, so E is much more common in the English language than um, Z or Q um, for that matter. And so that means that if you look at simply just looking at all of the symbols and you take the probabilities, then you can find an estimate. It's probably around three and a half to four, four bits, as was guessed. But it's probably even less than that. Why? Sorry? It's more likely to be a vowel. Okay, it's, it's likely to be a vowel. But it's also two words, right? And because it's two words, if you were to search through all the dictionary that look at two words, and they probably, these words are correlated, right? I'm not going to put two random words up there, likely. You're, you're going to say that this entropy is going to go down even more, okay? So there are various things. And then probably knowing a little bit about me or the context or all these sorts of things, you can start to put that. Why, why this letter will be go down if these two words are correlated? Okay. 
mean, are, do, are, are we conditioning on the other letters or what? Or we're just that's we're conditioning on the fact that we're that, that, that we, there's a two-word sequence with those legs. That's right. All right fine. So if you scan a dictionary, right, and you look at all possible two words, it's like these words are going to be correlated, and you can right, say fine. something about. Okay, this is good. If if I I okay, good. So you're you're thinking this is great. Um, now I'm giving you these two um, hints. Okay, your entropy has gone down, but probably not by much. Okay, does anyone does anyone have it? Has anyone's entropy gone to zero? Right? It's just a measure of your uncertainty. I believe that the, the issue of two words is relevant now and was not relevant in the first Okay, that's probably true. Okay. I think someone's entropy has gone to zero. The first one, for sure. You take the uniform answers or you take whether once I can get the zero? Someone's going to win the thousand dollars. What is it? Q start meeting. Okay. So now. If we got to this point and I needed to spell out what that was, I'd be concerned, right? Um, do, well, I don't even need to encode this, right? Uh, I don't even, and in fact, that's the reason why probably you in Hebrew don't even have your pointed. So, but when I read pointed Hebrew, my entropy is much higher than your entropy. I'm always not quite sure what I'm reading. I, I can read, but probably at an elementary level. Um, so. Anyway, this is, um, we're dropping this value, but you already know what that symbol is. I don't even need to put it in there, okay? So Shannon um, actually did this, and he did s several uh, really quite amazing things. But in summary, he showed that the actual number of bits per symbol in the English language is about one. And it varied somewhere between about 0.6 to uh, 1.3, I think, is is what I've seen. So anyway, we, it's about one bit per symbol because of the fact that there's a high degree of correlation between your symbols, right? So if you started to encode things based on the probabilities of various letters within the English alphabet, then you're going to be uh, coding at a very inefficient rate. But if you compress here, in fact, text coding, I think they use these block codings and you look at um, block Well, I mean, there are many ways to go about it, right? Block coding assumes that you look at uh, an ergodic uh, source, and then you make these very long blocks, and then you divide by the entropy per symbol. Okay. And, and then, but there's also a different way, which he just used humans. And he said, OK, um, what do you think the next letter is? Right? And it turns out that there's a lot of inter-symbol correlation, and it turned out to be very, those two things turned out to be very similar. OK, so um, anyway, I just. What if a marriage therapist was an information theorist? I thought that, I won't go into that. So, um, so Shannon entropy for images. Um, <laughs> oh, really? Uh, anyway. <laughs> Silly, but uh, I don't know. It just came to me one day while I was doing some random calculation, probably. OK, so. Um, now, Shannon entropy for images. Um, compression, this is how we normally do things. What we do is we, um, we take, we sense something, right? We take a picture. We go to some beautiful place, which we have the last few days, and saw neat things. But um, we, we initially get an enormous amount of information here, right? If you think about a pixelated camera, you have 8-bit resolution on three different colors plus a couple of other bits per pixel multiplied by my friend has a 64 megapixel camera. You take 64 megapixels multiplied by 200 and, um, uh, more, by about 26 bits uh, per pixel, and you're talking about an enormous amount of information. Your SD card is obviously not going to hold that. Right? So um, what we do is we sense... We take this, and then we compress it, right? And we put it in uh, some JPEG compression format. Uh, there's actually more efficient uh, programs, but everyone seems to like JPEG still. And if we look at it, what we're really doing is we're removing the interpixel correlation. So now let's say I take a pixel, picture of my face, right? If I look at one pixel that is up in one part of my forehead and another pixel that's in another part of my forehead, I don't need to have 26 I don't need to have 8-bit resolution on all three of those colors 
going from one part of my forehead to another part of my forehead. There's very little fluctuation going from those things. That means there's a, a very little amount of information that's actually going across uh, my forehead, even though we are originally taking it in this high bit, uh, in this high um, information content. So what we're going to do with these correlations is remove these interpixel correlations by decomposing in a transform basis. Okay, so what we're going to really be doing here is trying to find a k-sparse representation of an image. Now, I haven't met, met a natural scene that doesn't have a k-sparse representation, which means almost any scene you give me has long-range order. Only random patterns um, tend to be dense. When I say k-sparse, it means, oops, sorry. When I say k-sparse, that means there's only a few k elements when transformed into a decorrelated basis where, um, that are actually important. Okay, so that's what is meant by k-sparse. And so you can do this in many different um, transform bases. The discrete cosine transform, the discrete Fourier transform, wavelets, um, curvelets. There are many, many different types of uh, decorrelated transform bases. One that we find really interesting is the, the uh, total variation, which is um, if, I'm, if I'm taking a picture in LIDAR, for example, usually at one depth there's only one object. So you can imagine if you have a person that from here the person reflects and from here there's no reflection. The, the sparsity in the gradient, it's very sparse in the gradient because you're going from nothing to some, suddenly something. And uh, that's, uh, this, the sparsity in the gradient turns out to be extremely important and very useful. So here's a, just a picture of my son a few years ago. Uh, I just took a 512 by 512. I do the discrete for, uh, cosine transform up here. And if you look at this, it's all up in the upper left-hand corner. And that is the zero in X and the zero in, and this, the higher, higher spatial frequencies going down this way, higher spatial frequencies going this way for X and for Y. And what that means is almost all of the content of that image is in just the very, very few elements in the upper left-hand corner as you would expect, right? You can see a dark, a bright, and a dark. Here you see a dark, a bright, a dark, a bright, a dark, a bright, uh, so on and so forth. So if I take this, do a filter on it, which is I want to take the 81 most important elephants. It's a very simple filter. There are lots of filters, which I'll explain in just a moment. But um, if I take a filter and I take only 81 of those original elements, this is a 512 by 512. This is like 265,000 pixels. Is that 81 just the 81 largest. Okay. I just take the 81 largest um, that, and do the inverse discrete cosine transform. This is the image that I get. You can already see a, a, an outline. And going up and taking more and more, here I have about 13,000, uh, which is about 5% uh, sparsity. And it's a pretty good copy of the original. Now, actually, uh, JPEG actually does something even more, um, even better improved, which is so you sample at least twice the Nyquist frequency or the highest frequency in the system. You transform to a sparse basis, such as the discrete cosine transform. This is what JPEG actually does. Then you preferentially attenuate up here. I, our eyes are really good at seeing dark, bright contrast, but they're not see good at seeing dark, bright contrast over short ranges. And so you can actually preferentially attenuate this uh, region and, um, and then Basically, you round the coefficients and do the inverse transform. And when you do this, you usually uh, they apply a, what's called Huffman coding in here to, to store it, which is about five to five percent above five to seven percent above uh, the Shannon um, entropy for that image. Okay, so now typical sensing. So you compress after you sense. You get a huge amount of information and then you compress. Whereas compressed sensing does the opposite or not, not necessarily the opposite, it, it compresses while you sense. And that's a very important thing because there are many situations in which you may have uh, very limited resources when you don't want to collect all that information and then immediately discard it. I was just talking to someone at uh, DARPA a little while back and they have this semi-freaky camera, uh, uh, two gigapixels of, uh, they can look at an entire city and see um, people walking around. I mean, it's just uh, enormous, but they have enormous amounts of data thrown in there, and then they discard about 
uh, uh, you know, 90% of it immediately, but the, the, sh the sheer data throughput is more than they can handle. And so they're very interested in looking at um, very sparse realizations of their scenes. So, um, and if you want to look at this, these are a couple of tutorials. Uh, this is a couple of tutorials that I really liked, one by Barania Kuzit Rice and Candice uh, um, USC. Uh, both wrote, wrote very nice things. And this is probably the, the thing that really got compressive sensing going was this single pixel camera by the Rice Group. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what is called L1 norm minimization. There's actually numerous ways of, of of doing this, but I'm just going to show you a little bit about the mathematics of what's happening here. So suppose I have a signal x of length n and a transform basis s. So this is my original signal. That's my picture, s, uh, x. And s is my sparse representation of that picture. Okay. Now, um, if this is a one-dimensional signal, then I need an n by n, um, n by n transform in order to go to this new basis. Now, we require a sensing matrix phi. So sensing matrix, I'm going to explain this a little bit more. Don't worry about it too much yet. But we require the sensing matrix to not be sparse. In other words, we call these dense, um, dense in the transformed basis. So you need something that ha when you transform, it is, there is no sparse representation of it. OK, this is uh, called the incoherence or restricted isometry property. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to take that original signal multiply it by this, for example, random set of uh, this random pattern matrix, and then you get what are called projections. Okay? And um, these random length n sensing matrices um, satisfy this requirement. So it turns out that the number of random measurements that you need to recover the signal goes as k, which is the number of sparse coefficients which we could have said was a few hundred in that picture of my son, for example, or say a few thousand, times the log base 2 of the number of pixels, right, which was 265,000 divided by this k again, which is much, much less than n. And that's uh, the really important part here. Then we do what is referred to as a convex optimization algorithm, which is that you want to minimize the sum of these sparse coefficients subject to this measurement matrix. Now, I'm going to try and explain this a little bit here through pictures. So this is one of the uh, undergraduates I had working here, uh, Matt Ware. He's basically a scene. He's going to be our scene. We're going to take that scene, and we're going to put him on a random sensing pattern. So this is one pattern that we have. Now, I take this amount of light coming in here. I multiply it by this mirror being on. So what this is is a DMD, a digital micro mirror device, which has an array of mirrors that are either on or off. Okay, so it's just uh, a Boolean uh, multiplication of the amount of intensity here by that pixel being on. Then we take all of the intensity falling on that um, where the pixels are on, and then um, we put that into a photodiode, and that represents one uh, random projection, okay? And we need m random projections. As we were saying, that's k log n over k over 2, uh, k log um, n over k. Uh, that is the, the minimum number of measurements we need in order to reconstruct mat based on looking at random projections. So we take one pattern, we look at the intensity falling on here for that pattern. We know what that pattern is. Even though it is random, we know what it is. Then we do another random pattern, we take an intensity. Another random pattern, take the intensity. We put those all, all together, do a convex optimization algorithm, and then we're able to reconstruct the image. Okay, so a little bit of a measurement uh, complexity. Now, why, why compressive sensing? Who cares? I mean, it turns out that this has some really fundamental and very interesting things. We only need to sample at the information rate not at the Nyquist rate. And here's a simple example. Suppose I tell you that I'm going to give you a wave. And it turns out it's just a sine wave. Right? In order to sample at the Nyquist frequency, you have to be uh, twice the frequency of that sine wave. Now, you, you sample for a very long time. And what do you determine? That you have a single frequency. Right? The amount of information in that single frequency in K-space 
is one sparse, right? In other words, almost no information was coming at you, but it required an enormous amount of resources in order to determine that, okay? So this is um, a, a sort of a, a, a demonstration. You only need to sample at the information rate, not at the Nyquist rate. And um, it, the reason why it's so valuable is it's very resource efficient. Um, basically, when size, cost, technology, uh, computer requirements, all those sorts of things come into play, it can be a very uh, nice alternative. If you have a, a very cheap uh, CCD array that does everything you need, then you don't want compressive sensing. But there are many situations in which it's very nice. Um, requires fewer measurements and automatically, fi automatically finds these large space uh, large case based coefficients, and the data throughput is just dramatically reduced. Okay, so um, how much time do I have left? Okay. Including question, you have minutes. Okay, great. So these are just some neat uh, things I've seen recently. Basically, um, the Rice group replaced their single pixel detector with a spectrometer and did hyperspectral imaging, right, at, with uh, like nanometer resolution. Very interesting result, uh, but very simple. Uh, this is a uh, Modi Segev's uh, group that has been recently doing some uh, very interesting things with subdiffractive imaging. Um, then there was uh, basically, this is a collaboration um, we did with MIT, basically doing compressive depth map, uh, depth map acquisition using a parametric processing. And then um, compressive, this is also a rice group, they did compressive background um, subtraction. And then uh, also Miles Paget's group has recently uh, done basically shape from shade using compressive sensing and were able to show that they could get a three-dimensional view of an object um, just using structured illumination rather than structured detection. So um, now so some of the things we've been working on. So ghost imaging with entangled photons, photon counting LIDAR, um, depth maps, object tracking, and high dimensional entanglement characterization. So let me explain some of these. So there was a nice um, work by Jeff Shapiro and uh, Jeroen Silberberg uh, shortly followed that uh, with an experimental paper in which they showed that um, if you can structure the illumination. So what I've showed you so far is what I would call structure detection. We just put out a source, we illuminate an object, and then we, we have some d DMD array that structures the light, and then we measure that. But you can do the, the, the reverse for the source. You can structure the source. You can look, for example, at a speckle pattern. And um, because you know what the predicted speckle pattern is from your uh, propagation and, um, for example, if you have a spatial light modulator, then you can let that propagate and um, you can then look back at a single bucket detector. Light coming back into that bucket detector will be able to then predict uh, what, that, uh, what that image is. Now, what we did was uh, basically along the lines of the original uh, ghost imaging, which is in ghost imaging, for example, you have correlated photon pairs in transverse momentum and position. And one of the photons passes through an object and then falls onto a bucket detector, which gets no spatial resolution. But since the other photon is correlated with it, um, then uh, there's all the transverse information is basically in its, its partner. But what's been done previous to this is that you raster scanned a single fiber because you only have these single photon detectors uh, with a single pixel. So if we replace uh, the, the single pixel with a uh, compressive sensing architecture, then we can use all of the photons coming off there rather than just the looking at the flux of, of a single uh, raster scanned detector. And the take home message is, this took us about a half a day to acquire the signal. Had we done this with raster scanning, it would have taken us about three years. So uh, it's, it's much more efficient. So now, LIDAR. I think this is really quite a fascinating project. Uh, so there is a, a, a project uh, called Jigsaw at MIT in which they use these focal plane arrays of single mode Geiger detectors. So they have a 32 by 32 array of detectors. Um, and basically what they have is they have sub nanosecond time resolution. So they can pulse a scene, look at the backscattered light, 
get time of arrival information on the various points on their detector, and then they can create a depth map of everything. And I, I, I went there and looked at this, and it's it really quite neat. So they, they show um, everything that's down in a forest and what's all the way down to the ground. And they can say, here's what's his site, here's at this site, here are the leaves, here are the leaves, here are the cars, here are the people, here are the... Um, it's, uh, so you can, you can see all of that stuff. The reason why you want to do it in Geiger mode is because you don't have any amplification noise associated with the um, quantum noise of, of amplifying the system. And um, you can do all sorts of inter interesting things. However, you have a low fill, fill factor. It's difficult to scale. It's expensive, resource heavy, visible wavelengths, and it's a large payload. But here you can see only things which are not covered by other things. Yeah, so typically they only need about 2% um, open. So if there's 98% coverage, um, they can still see in it, but it's see not in houses. Yeah, the, the, then uh, that's not 98%. That's 100% coverage. Yeah. <laughs> so it's camouflage. I, I'm going to show that we looked through camouflage uh, using this technique. Uh, and there it was a, f a few percent transmission. So this is basically the equipment needed to run uh, jigsaw. So, but and, and notice that was a 32 by 32. We're able to take 256 by 256 with a single APD and um, structuring our detection. So all we do is put out a very, we put out a weak pulse of light, illuminates the scene, get the transverse information off the DMD array, and then we get the timing information um, using the sub nanosecond uh, response time of the APD. And then we correlate the transmission and arrival and we're able to reconstruct uh, scene. So here's just a, a simple demonstration. We have a cutout, cardboard cutout of you and R. Um, this is not the initiation of a text message in English. This is uh, University of Rochester. Um, so um, U as at one depth, R is at another depth. So what you do is you take the intensity and you, you sum all of the time of arrivals in this, in this bin, and that's what you get here. If we take all and do compressive sensing on the time of arrivals in this bin, this is what we get here. And then if we put these two together, um, then this is the image that we form. And then we put uh, burlap, uh, which is camouflage, uh, what people often use in camouflage. And we put a burlap bag in front of the UR. And then we said, here's, here's what a camera looks like, and here's what uh, the, or maybe this was the reconstruction. One of them's a reconstruction, one of them is uh, just an, a regular high, high definition camera. And then here's the reconstructed image looking at only the small amount of light coming back through, uh, back through the burlap. And so this was, this was very high coverage, and, and it makes it look like it's the relative height of these, but it's not. It's actually, um, this is actually much higher relative to this. So we only needed a very little bit of light in order to reconstruct this image. Okay, so now we've improved that quite a bit, and um, we're able to now make, take movies uh, in real time of uh, three-dimensional um, objects and basically what we have is a ball that we swung on a pendulum and we were able to, to track the uh, position of that ball. Here's the, the uh, depth resolution that we were able to get, which as you can see is extremely good. And then here's the X and the Y um, as we were able to follow that ball in three dimensional space in real time. Uh, or or at, I think we did this up to 28 frames per second. So, um, and, and this is with uh, about 300 femtowatts of light. So this is just a, a picture of the, the things. And um, then what we did is uh, uh, another one of my students came up with a really interesting idea, which is instead of, of taking a time histogram, what if all we did was take the light coming off of, of that detector and then we simply, we, we, we collect all those photons and we simply sum the amount of time that we get with each projection. So we sum the amount of time and we take an intensity projection. So this is, here, here's an intensity projection, here's a reconstruction of that uh, system. Here is a time intensity. In other words, all these photons are arriving at a certain time. And for that projection, I may get a million photons, some are scattered from the truck, some are from the U, and some are from the R. And so you simply sum those times and um, then 
you can reconstruct the intensity, you can reconstruct the time intensity, and when you divide these through, you actually get a depth, which is just the time of flight that it took from all those things. And so we're able to see that the truck is a, about uh, a slightly, in this case, it was about uh, 1,200, um, I think this is 1,200 millimeters, and this was about, uh, oh, sorry, the truck was about 1,300 millimeters, the, the U was at about 1,200 millimeters, and the R was at about 1,100 millimeters. So uh, these are all um, a fairly good uh, depth resolution here. Okay, so now how about for quantum uh, purposes? We, we are, we're very interested in looking at the characterization of, of entanglement, especially high dimensional entanglement. I did a lot of low dimensional entanglement for my uh, postdoc and I just found it was uh, exciting to think about uh, very high dimensional systems. But it's also very hard to characterize high dimensional systems. Uh, for one, if you tried to do tomography on for example, we use over a thousand different transverse spatial modes. Uh, you wouldn't want to do tomography on it, right? The density matrix there is enormous. And so what we did is actually came up with our own um, mutual information um, inequalities and also uh, tests of, of, of transverse entanglement, basically <laughs> getting uh, entanglement witnesses in very high dimensions. And so what we did initially is we said, well, let's have a detector in which we turn on a pixel here and turn on a pixel here. And then we'll turn on the pixel here and then here and then here. And we'll look at all of the joint probabilities for each one of these things. And then after you've done all thousand here, then you move one here and repeat. Move one here, repeat, right? Uh, this is an enormous amount of time even to do something that isn't um, tomography, it's simply just looking at all the joint probabilities. And <coughs> uh, this took a long time, took about 50 hours, and we semi-cheated because it would have taken us a year if we'd done it um, properly. Yes? Are you trying to measure byproduct entanglement between different two points? Yes. So what we're looking at is a two-point correlation intensity, intensity correlation function. So what we're trying to do is say is, if I have a, a detector that's turned on here, I'll get reflected light into a detector, and then I want to see how much reflect, reflected light I get over here. And I, I find I don't get anything, don't get anything, don't get anything. And then when I find it's correlated pixel, suddenly I get a lot of flux um, from that particular point. Okay. So um, we, we redid this with compressive sensing and basically did what we refer to as a double pixel detector. And with this double pixel detector, uh, we were able to show that we could get uh, very high dimensional correlations. And the scaling, remarkably, so I, I said that the number of measurements that you needed to do was k log n over k. And now if you think about entanglement, entanglement is there, for those of you who've thought a lot about entanglement, you have these photons going off to one side, going off to another side. There's a lot of uncertainty in the single photon. In other words, in real space, there is no sparse representation because almost all of the pixels are being, are almost all the pixels are, are uh, filled with, with uh, photons. Same on the other side. So in its um, single photon, the marginals are dense. But if you look at the joint space, it's very sparse because every time I find one here, I only find it here. And then when I move it, I, I find an extreme sparsity, which means it is a high degree of correlation and extreme sparsity in space. So if I have n pixels on here and n pixels on here, really k is only n, right? Just the number of pixels here because I have, it's the number of pixels on here and for every pixel here, I find only one pixel here. So if I look at that, k is n, a log of n squared over n. And so you just get that the scaling is n log n, which we found to be in very good agreement with uh, what we measure, rather than um, um, between n to the third and n to the fourth for just doing a joint raster scan. And you can think about it this way. If I have to do, I have to do n measurements here, but every, for every, n, every measurement here, I have to do n measurements here. But the flux, is the single photon flux hitting on that detector. The higher resolution I have, the less flux is falling on a single detector. And so it becomes divided on each side by n. So you can see how this would um, go as n to the fourth. 
So it, it really blows up rapidly. And with this, um, it basically, it took us a few hours. We actually predicted about a 10 to the fifth. Uh, we only measured about a 10 to the third improvement, uh, but uh, that was a somewhat conservative estimate on the amount of time it would have taken us to do this with a joint raster scan. Uh, so that, that recently came out. So as someone was hand-waving a second ago, they did this, and they're exactly right, which is if you look in P space, momentum, momentum, you get this, this diagonal correlation, which means for every pixel you get here, there's only one pixel that fires, but it's anti-correlated in momentum, right? So if I have a, a ray right here, if I fire, find one here, I'll find the other one down here, right? And if I go over here, I'll find it, this one over here. Um, and so they're anti-correlated. It's very much uh, um, similar to what Yaron Silverberg was talking about yesterday. Uh, but in position space, they're correlated, which means for every time you find one here, you'll find one here. And it just uh, goes like this. And we were able to uh, reconstruct those with very high fidelity. And yet, oops, um, here is the uh, marginals that you can reproduce simply by uh, summing over one of those dimensions. So um, recently, a little while back, we, because uh, we wanted to demonstrate, we didn't want to have to reconstruct a density matrix for this and then do, um, and then say uh, what we wanted to. What we'd rather do is come up with our own um, witness of entanglement. So what we did is we took a, some ideas based on um, Steve Walborn's and we came up with our own um, discretization of a continuous space and uh, basically came up with in essentially entanglement witnesses there. And um, it turned out that Steve Walborn was working on exactly the same thing. And uh, we had exactly the same uh, paper, essentially, within a few days on the archive. After he saw ours, then we decided to collaborate on the next project. Uh, so um, anyway, so this was, a, um, this was a good sign that we could, that we could uh, violate entanglement witness. So in this particular instance, we only needed about uh, five bits if we sum the mutual and Shannon mutual information in one basis and the Shannon mutual information in another basis, then um, we, I think it was about five bits and you can see that we were above that in order to violate uh, that witness. Okay, so this is um, uh, the last thing. Oh, by the way, uh, we are, I am pretty excited about another thing we're working on with that, which is the, the quantum mutual information is a really hard thing to find unless you know the density matrix. But we've pretty much, we're very, very close to sh finishing showing that the quantum mutual information is greater than or equal to the Shannon mutual information in two mutually unbiased bases. And we've shown it for pure states, for nice symmetric states, and, uh, with, and a host of large density matrices. But we still have to work on the arbitrariness. But I think that'll be quite neat because then you don't need to do reconstruction of the density matrix at all. You'd simply need to know the mutual. That's an experiment. That's a theoretical. Yeah, we're doing that theoretically. Which means that you can find the quantum mutual information. Um, so if someone's already done that, I would be happy. To, did you already do that? Oh, well, you have to show me that. Well, I was getting very excited about it, but I'm sure someone's probably already thought of it. OK, so um, now um, the last thing is background subtraction. And I think this is the probably the coolest thing about compressive sensing that I've seen so far. If you watch a movie, it's absolutely incredible that you can watch an HD movie that's two hours long that's only about three gigabytes in size. If, have you, if you haven't thought about that, you should think really hard about that. That is absolutely incredible, right? Um, and that basically comes from the fact that you can not only compress transverse, but you can also compress in time. And here's the basic idea. Right, if I'm looking at a static scene, um, all I really need to know is what's, what's changing in the scene. I don't need to reconstruct the entire scene. Right? If I want to compress, I basically want to look at the dynamic elements of the scene, not the static elements. And um, can you do this in compressive sensing? The answer is yes. And it's really amazing because um, you don't even need to know what the background is. All you need to know is a few projections of the background that is according to the sparsity of the changing object. So let me uh, suppose you're taking a picture of a forest and a bunny jumps out from behind a tree, right? You're only interested in following the bunny. Well, do you call them bunnies here? Right. Rabbits? 
Okay. Uh, a hair? I don't know. Okay, so some, okay, so a person jumps out from behind a, a tree. Okay, you're interested in the person. You're not interested in the forest, right? Those are called, um, it's called static clutter. You don't really care about the forest anymore. But all you need to do is take a few projections of the forest in order to reconstruct the person. You don't even need to know what the forest is. You don't even need to know what it looks like. You, all, all you need is a few random projections of the forest, and then you can do it. And it turns out that you only need enough projections to reconstruct the, the sparse change in the scene. You don't need to worry about anything else in the scene. So here's a demonstration with uh, um, uh, ghost imaging. But basically what we have on one side is a scene, and all we have is a DMD with a, a picture on it. It's a farmyard with a UFO coming across it. Right? We don't really care about the tree or the house. or We're only interested in the UFO, right? So UFO watchers will probably love compressive sensing. Um, and then on the other side, we have these random patterns to help us get the, uh, to the correlated um, information. So here's, here is the static scene. Aha, wow, change the, uh, ignore this, I guess. Um, so this is, the, um, this is the house, this is the tree, this is the moon. And then what you can see here, this little inset is actually the new scene. So we have the house, the tree, the moon, and the UFO is coming on. Now with background subtraction, all you're interested in is what the dynamic elements, and that's the UFO. So what we did is essentially track the UFO across the uh, screen um, as it went um, from one side to the other side. And um, so this is, this is a really fascinating thing. I, I, one thing I think that there's real possibilities here, for example, is imaging, for example, BECs that are falling and they want to look at dynamic elements in a BEC or only want to look at the, the non-static components. Or there are many different situations in which I can imagine that, you, that it's going to be very difficult to get um, uh, the sorts of things with a very low light flux um, in order to be able to, to be able to do this. So um, I will end here. Um, so this is a novel acquisition. Um, we believe it can be useful for quantum imaging, entanglement mutual information, LIDAR, uh, precision measurements. I haven't really talked about that, but I think there's some really interesting stuff that can be done here, um, is especially since it, it's, it's semi-adaptive in that you can learn from the scene as you go, and then um, real-time uh, video of, in low flux uh, settings. Okay, thank you. When you have some plate of black and white that defines what light's coming through the measure, it kind of looks like a random pattern. I can imagine in a kind of doing it in a foyer basis where you have stripes, okay, and, and it seems like you use this kind of a random basis. Why is that better? We actually use several things. Um, and in fact, um, we actually have been using uh, fast Hadamard transforms uh, because they're, they're nice. For example, you'd want to use a discrete, coast, a discrete Fourier transform just because there are so many fast ways of doing that in processing. Um, there's also similar things for fast Hadamard transforms that look almost random, um, but we've been using fast Hadamard. I just showed random because it's an easy thing to think about. And the nice thing about random as well is that uh, random patterns are dense in any, there is, no, there is no transformed basis where random patterns aren't dense. And so it's, it's really useful. So you can actually reconstruct an image, you, you take these random projections, and you can say in post-processing, I want to think about this in the wavelet transform, I want to think about in the, the um, co Fourier tra uh, cosine transform, Fourier transform, I can think of any transform basis after I've already taken the measurements. So you're saying that No, I'm not saying they're better, okay. but they are very functional in many situations. So why do you use them? I, I, we don't. Okay. We use fast Hadamard transforms. Okay. You talked earlier about sampling uh, a cosine, maybe a sine function that has a very high frequency, and yeah. if you would need a lot of sample. So, you, 
when you use compressive sensing, do you need any information that that will really be a single frequency component or maybe that will, will have a very low bandwidth or do you just know nothing about the signal and you're able to sample much lower than the Nyquist frequency to get? Well, um, I, I kind of cheated on that one. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine, uh, let's think about it in real space. Suppose I had a high frequency, um, suppose it just went dark, bright, dark, bright, really fast across the screen. You would, in, in, and if you look at our discrete cosine transform, you'd see a single element in that particular space. But I still had to have, in this particular situation, I still had to have pixels um, that, I still had to have pixels at various points to reproduce that, that uh, cosine transform. Um, so uh, this DMD ha is a fairly high resolution object. Uh, so I'm, I'm using essentially the resolution of the DMD is what, what it ends up coming. Though. Um, the, the actual number of measurements that I need to do is much less than what I would need to do if I were to, to go along uh, that point and trying to reconstruct that entire image. Right, but uh, if you would know that m this is just a, s a single frequency, then you'd, you would uh, you could just sample in a very low bandwidth, right? That's right. You could put a notch filter, right? Or right. So and yeah, but but what what I'm saying with compressive sensing is you you don't have any a priori information. Okay. So yeah. Looks like we have one more here. Maybe it's connected to the uh, uh, last question. Uh, the question is, are the patterns, sp specific patterns, which will ruin this technology in, in the sense that you come, you sense them, you get, oh, I know, uh, you say, I know what I get, I see it, but it's completely different from what you get because somehow it, it fails on exactly the, the bits that you did not measure. I mean, I'm not sure I understand the question. You mind repeating it? I mean, you get uh, a certain amount of, of bits of information out of the um, of the of the data of, of what to measure, mm -hmm. yeah. and and you say I lower the amount of information I need in order to get things out. Yeah. But the question is as follows: You get less information, so there are certain patterns which you might not be able to to get out because they have more information. The question is, can you know when a pattern uh, is beating your algorithm and, and you don't, and you get the wrong picture? I think, I think uh, do you know when a, the information rate is more than what you sample? In a sense, yes. Yeah, you don't, you can't reconstruct the image. There's some very uh, interesting results, and in, uh, maybe I'm not understanding, but so there are phase transitions that happen in here that when you get to a certain critical number of measurements, you actually see a very high mean squared error, and then suddenly it drops dramatically, and then it's like a, a, a real phase transition. And one thing that we have explored that we haven't, I didn't talk about here was the photons. We've actually explored the photon phase transition as well that... Um, coming from a quantum optics perspective, we'd like to know the minimum flux you need in order to start reproducing images. And um, it's, it's really quite beautiful. And I didn't have time to show it, but you see these, it's just noise. And then all of a sudden, you see a clear image. Yeah. Two questions. The easy one is I didn't really get if you can see through clouds. Well, um, I mean, you just need the right uh, wavelength of light. Uh, some wavelengths pass through clouds much better than others. So if you have, uh, you could see through clouds as long as your wavelength is able to penetrate the cloud. Right. Now, I mean, that's one of the beaut beauties of compressive sensing. It's very expensive to make high-resolution infrared cameras, but it's very cheap to have a single infrared pixel. And so you can, you can use the uh, compressive sensing. This is one of the killer apps of compressive sensing, that you can get high-resolution uh, infrared um, images. Um, so as long as you can see, uh, as a, if a, 
if a laser beam can make it through a cloud, you can see through the cloud and get high resolution images. Sure have, yeah. I'm in fact, I'm going to talk about it at the rump session tonight. Um, uh, don't ruin it. Okay, I won't ruin it. Okay. I'll well, to be continued. <laughs> okay. can, can you emphasize the difference between these classical techniques and classical? Because it's similar things you can do classically. Yeah, so basically this is... I, I, my, probably my title was incorrect that I put in the or, original thing, and that's why I went back to a previous title, which is that you can do compressive sensing in the quantum domain. This is a classical reconstruction technique. Um, and the, the thing is that you can use these techniques to um, do measurements that allow you to, re, to pull together um, quantum systems that are very different.